Welcome to Mystery Sauce. Let's get into today's story right away. Interior Washington strode into the crowded courtroom where every seat was occupied by eager spectators. The anticipation was palpable as she reflected on the improbable journey that led her to this moment. Nearly three decades had elapsed since the harrowing night of November 7, 1988. Yet here she stood in 2016, transformed and resolute. Gone was the fear that once gripped her. In its place, a steely determination radiated from her demeanor. With a poised stance and unwavering gaze, she prepared to address the court, her words unyielding and unstoppable. Across from her sat Lonnie Franklin Jr., confined behind a barrier of wire mesh, clad in an ill-fitted orange jumpsuit bearing the insignia of the Los Angeles County Jail. Despite his appearance, complete with thick framed glasses and a meticulously groomed mustache, Interior saw through the facade to the danger he represented. Summoning her courage, she took a deep breath, causing her silver and turquoise hoop earrings to sway gently, a subtle testament to her resilience. Despite the gravity of the moment, she chose to wear a vibrant blue tank top adorned with cheerful floral prints. A silent celebration of her survival mingled with sorrow for those who weren't as fortunate. With unwavering resolve, she approached the stand. My name is Interior Washington, she declared, her voice steady as she met Lonnie's gaze. I am one of your victims, your only living victim. There had been something sweet about the man as he sat unexpectedly in the orange Ford Pinto with the white racing stripe painted onto the front hood. His thick rimmed nerdy glasses and black button up polo shirt certainly didn't match the gaudiness of his pimped out car. She noticed his shirt was tucked neatly into his khaki pants and interior was intrigued. After all, it was Saturday night in Los Angeles on November 7th, 1988. And after a long and emotional breakup with her husband and a visit down south with her relatives in Louisiana, Interior was looking for a distraction. She was only 30 years old and had a lot of living left to do. Tall and curvy, with curly short brown hair and flashing eyes, Interior didn't want her ex-husband to bring her down. He was just one man. She wanted to feel good, to feel alive, to feel sexy. She was headed to a party where her longtime best friend, Lydia, who promised that a night of dancing with some good-looking guys would cheer her up. Even though it was already November, the night was still warm, so Interior had decided to walk over to Lydia's house, which was just a 10-minute stroll from hers, where she stopped by the stranger in the car. The tricked-out car slid up to the cement curb, its engine idling and tailpipe blowing out smoke. At first, Interior ignored the driver. She had not enough sense to know not to stop and talk to anyone. But the car kept pulling up and following her. Finally, Interior stopped. She peeked further into the Pinto. She was impressed by the cleanliness of its interior and diamond-patterned white leather bucket seats. It went well with her white miniskirt and the seats were spotless. There wasn't a scrap of dirt or food anywhere something she didn't often see on the south side of Los Angeles. The stick shift looked like a cue stick with a white pool ball on top. Maybe she judged the driver too harshly. Before she could apologize, however, he spoke. Come on, I'll give you a ride, said the stranger. Interior considered the prospect. He seemed fairly anarchist. It was either accept the ride or walk another 10 minutes. Usually, she didn't mind wandering through the streets of her beloved neighborhood. But in the 1980s, her familiar stomping grounds had become dangerous. Gangs had taken over the streets, and there was an ongoing war between the Bloods and the Crips. Crack was everywhere, an epidemic that ravaged her community. Buildings were empty and burned out. They were either filled with drug dealers, addicts, or prostitutes selling their wares. Now born and raised on the south side of Los Angeles, Interior was no pushover. She knew how to handle herself, and she wasn't afraid of the streets. But she was also fun, someone who could throw caution to the wind. So she decided 
It couldn't hurt to get a ride to her friend's house. She opened the passenger door and helped right inside. Now as he drove, they bantered back and forth. He was funny and had an answer to everything. She matched him up, quip for quip. As he spoke, and Terry could feel her early sadness lift. She was actually having fun. In the spur of the moment, she invited the man to come to the party. I'll go, he said, turning his bespectacled face to Interior. The man drove down a side street telling Interior he had to get some money from his uncle before they could go to the party. He pulled the car up to the curb in front of an old yellow house and without saying anything, ran inside. Interior tapped the car's upholstery, counting the moments, waiting for him to return. She didn't think anything of the brief stop. That was always the way it was with men, always dropping something off or forgetting something. She would have patience for only so long. If he didn't come out soon, Interior had thought she would leave. Finally, the guy exited the house and headed towards the car. As he opened the driver's door and slid inside, Interior could immediately tell that something had changed. Gone was the flirty coy man from minutes earlier. He now felt disconnected and cold as ice. His eyes had turned black. He started the car and pulled away, staring straight ahead. Silence enveloped the car, broken only by the thunderous beat of Interior's heart reverberating in her chest. Now anxious, she absolutely wiped her clammy hands on her miniskirt. Her mind racing with indecision. Something fell off about this man. A sudden shift in his demeanor sending warning signals coursing through her veins. Why had she agreed to get into this car? Should she demand he stop so she could exit and continue on foot? Or should she endure the discomfort until they reach her friend's house? As she weighed her options, contemplating whether to unlatch the passenger door and make a daring escape, the man unleashed a barrage of insults with startling velocity. Caught off guard, Interior struggled to formulate a response, but her instincts surged to the forefront, her defenses instantly rising. This was mis unmistakably dangerous territory, and she refused to tolerate his disrespect. Who do you think you're talking to? She asked, her voice as tough as nails. She had her neighborhood querulous in hope he got the message that she wasn't a woman to mess with. He didn't respond, but instead pulled out a sub nose handgun out of his jacket. He pointed the gun straight at her chest and without warning, pulled the trigger. A loud crack filled the air as the bullet shot out of the handgun, hitting her square in the chest at point blank range. You shot me, Interior screamed. She looked down at the front of her white and blue peasant's shirt. It was her favorite top to go out dancing in, and now she saw that the fabric was covered in dark red blood. She had an inane thought about never able to get the stain out. But as the blood spread, she could make out a round bullet hole in the middle of her chest. Through the wound, she could see the inside of her guts, of her body. Interior told herself, Okay, don't panic, don't panic. If you panic, you're a goner. Now before Interior had a chance to make her next decision, her attacker pushed her back onto the passenger seat, climbed on top of her, and pulled up her miniskirt. Blood was spilling all over the white seat, and she thought at least he won't be able to get away with it if the liquid stains the seats. Interior was bigger and stronger than he was, but because she had so much blood coming out of her chest, she had no strength to resist. He pressed his dry lips roughly onto hers. Interior tried to move her face away, but he was persistent. He bore into her body. I'm bleeding. You shot me in the chest. Get off me, Interior yelled, but he didn't listen. Instead, he pushed Interior further back against the seat. She couldn't believe that this was going to be her demise. She turned her head and tried to search out the stars in the inky black Los Angeles sky. A tear rolled out her cheek, suspended against her skin. Then she summoned some of her strength and kicked him hard, struggling to break free of his grasp. She grabbed the car's cold handle. It was tightly shot, as if it was wedged into place. But she twisted and turned the metal as hard as she could. She struggled to get up and pro propel herself out of the car seat. The man grabbed her and pushed her back down. 
and Turia felt her momentarily burst of power sap. But then he let go of her arms and a bright flash blinded her. What was that? Was he shining a flashlight in her eyes? As the light illuminated the car, she could see her attacker's hands were occupied. It looked like he was holding a Polaroid, one of those newfangled cameras that were all the rage. It was big and bulky, and she was certain that was what it was. Then the flash went off again. He was taking pictures of her lying helpless against her car seat, bloodied and battered. She had enough strength left to lunge forward and grab the camera, but her attacker easily pushed back. He flinched at her surprise lunge. Her attacker thought she had given up. He began fiddling with the Polaroid, preparing to take more photos. She couldn't worry about the camera a second longer. And Teria knew this was her last moment to try to escape. The adrenaline flooded her body. She grasped at the door handle, but it was slippery with blood, and her fingers couldn't get a grip on the knob. She clenched her fingers around the handle and pulled as hard as she could. Her attacker heard the sound. In a flash, he put down the camera, grabbed the gun, and began to beat her senseless. The cold steel smashed against her body and her skull. She could feel her bones crack against the instant force. She held her arms against her head, huddling underneath the flimsy protection, trying to shield herself from the powerful blows raining down on her. Blackness was closing in on her, but she willed herself to remain conscious. If she passed out, she knew that meant certain death. Then her attacker casually leaned her over and he opened the door a crack. She could hear the metal locks grind as they disengaged. He kicked Interior hard in her side in a, in a flash. She tumbled out of the car onto the greedy pavement. The orange pinto remained frozen as the driver loomed over her, making sure Interior's lifeless body remained crumpled on the ground. Then he started the car and sped off with a lurch. After she could no longer hear the tires on the pavement, Interior opened her eyes. The street was, de was desolate but she could hear some traffic noise nearby, but otherwise it was silent. All the buildings and houses in the street were dark and sleeping. She didn't know where she was or where to go. Her entire shirt and skirt were covered in red and stains smeared over her hands, hair, and face. Blood still flowed from the gaping hole in her chest. Her heart was racing and she could feel her strength fading. Life had taught Interior to help herself. Rolling over, she used the edges of her elbows to pull herself up. She could feel the gravel rocks push into the skin. Everything was slimy, and she kept slipping on blood slicks. But eventually, through sheer determination, she rose to her feet. Like a zombie, she used her hands to guide her. She held them out in front of her and started to zigzag down the streets. Weaving out steady, she soon realized she was walking down familiar roads. She wasn't that far from her best friend Lydia's house, so she continued to walk, leaving bloody smudges on the parked cars along the street. Then right there in front of her was Lydia's house. Her vision blurry, she could make out the lights in the two front windows, a beacon of hope, as she made her way onto the front porch, screaming her friend's name, Lydia! Lydia! And Teria pounded on the sturdy door with the back of her fist, but no one came to help. At her wit's end, all energy exhausted, she sunk onto the porch floor and blacked out. It was just past 1 a.m. when Lydia arrived home to find her best friend lying in front of her house, surrounded by a pool of blood. When Interior didn't show up to the party, Lydia assumed it was because she didn't want to attend. He beat me with his gun, Interior croaked to her friend before passing out once more. Lydia went inside and confronted her petrified children as to why they didn't open the door. Huddling in their beds, they told their mother they were too scared when they saw the screaming woman covered in blood approach the house. They didn't recognize Interior and were too nervous to let the unknown person inside the house. Lydia couldn't fault them. Seeing the state of her friend, she wasn't sure she would have unbolted the door either. She rushed towards the telephone and Interior opened her eyes while Lydia was dialing 911. In blue and white ambulance came screeching to Lydia's house and paramedics loaded the beaten woman inside. It was the early morning of November 8, 1988, 
when paramedics rushed her into the emergency room at Harbor UCLA Medical Center, a 570-bed public Los Angeles County Teaching Hospital located at 1000 West Carson Street in Torrance, California. They worked frantically to stop the blood from gushing out of the interior's chest. As Dr. John Robertson, the doctor on duty, prepared to take her into emergency surgery, they needed to operate immediately or they were going to tie off her arteries, stop the bleeding, and save her life. She had lost an enormous amount of blood and they needed to stanch her wounds so she could survive. Before she went under the knife, Interior calmly told the medical staff, staff she had been point blank shot by a stranger that assaulted her and tried to kill her. She wasn't going to even let a bullet in her chest stop this guy from getting away. Everyone needed to know what had happened so her attacker could be caught. The hospital staff called the Los Angeles Police Department and they came to investigate. The doctors were able to extract the damaged bullet lodged in her chest as evidence for the police. A few days after her surgery, detectives were at her bedside to hear her story. Unbeknownst to her, a rash of similar attacks had been happening on the south side of Los Angeles. Maybe the police surmised they were connected to what had happened to the survivor. Exhausted from her experience, she wanted to help the police catch the man who attacked her. She worked with the police sketch artist on a drawing. Even after the attack, her memory remained sharp and she was able to provide the artist with enough pertinent details to produce an accurate likeness of the madman. He was dark skinned with closely cropped hair and thick eyebrows shading light brown eyes. His image was distributed to police stations throughout Southern California. Police officers walked the streets, flyers clutched in their hands on the hunt for this elusive killer. The suspicions that he was the perpetrator of other incidents continued to rise. Police didn't tell Interior that numerous other women had been murdered over the past few years. Their profiles had been similar to hers, young, black, and struggling with a range of problems from drugs to prostitution. The abductions happened in the middle of the night or in the early morning hours. When witnesses were scars, all the women killed were from the south side of the city. And as the body count began to mount, the community grew outraged and groups formed demanding more answers. They started to put pressure on the LAPD to pay attention to their concerns. Community leaders felt the police weren't seriously investigating these crimes. They grew frustrated that these women whose lives often weren't valued, were getting murdered, and the police weren't making any progress. There was little evidence, few clues, and no eyewitnesses about how, what, who, and how and who was targeting these women. Now, however, the police had something to start with. The ballistics from the bullet in Interior's chest matched the gunshot wounds and the other dead girls. It was becoming clear the man who attacked Interior was also their killer. Still, detectives didn't tell Interior they believed her attacker was a serial killer. A few days after the attack, detectives took her out to see if they could find the orange Ford Pinto she described. They drove the streets but didn't find a match. During the 1980s in Southern California, Pintos were a common. It seemed one was parked on every corner, but all the cars they peeked into not had the unique white seats. And then just like that, the killing stopped. With no further evidence and no more bodies found, the trail went cold. Interior tried to get back on her feet, all the while feeling that the police didn't trust what she had told them. She confided to friends that the police behaved as though she were a prostitute or someone they didn't want to put the time and effort into. She felt demoralized. The more she tried to protest about the lack of attention to her case, the more she felt the detectives didn't believe her. She showed up at the police station. She asked the detectives where they were in, the, in their investigation. She tried not to get too upset. Instead, she threw herself into her church and went back to school for a degree in medical assisting. She was determined to move forward with her life. 13 years passed before the killer struck again. It was 2002, and again the police found the body of another young black girl, Princess Berthamex a runaway whose body was dumped on the south side. Two years later, the body of 35-year-old Mallory McCorvey was discovered by a crossing guard. And in 2007, 
25 year old Genesia Peters was found shot to death and covered with a garbage bag in an alley. This time though, detectives had something that they hadn't been possible all those years ago, DNA. Lab technicians were able to trace the DNA left on the bodies back to the murders that took place in the 1980s. It seemed the serial killer had awoken from his slumber. Even though police had the serial killer's genetic profile, they still had no idea who he was. He wasn't listed in any of the criminal databases, which meant that, surprisingly, the killer had never been arrested or fingerprinted. The LAPD formed a task force dedicated to hunting down the elusive murderer, but didn't alert the public of this new development. Within days, however, the LA Weekly, a local alternative paper, broke the story and they named the serial killer the Grim Sleeper for his long drought between murders. A local councilman offered a half a million dollar reward to the public in an effort to generate tips on the cold case. It was hard to get the general public interested in long dead prostitutes and barely any leads came in. The police pressed on. They hired a profiler to further understand the person they were hunting and he was able to generate specific characteristics of the killer. In, in a 2009 press conference, Detectives Dennis Killicone, who had been on the case for years, announced a chilling prophecy. He said the suspect, probably in his 50s or late 40s, was somebody that nobody would ever suspect, or are those types who would be described as a great neighbor. In the meantime, Interior's life was far removed from any of these new developments. She didn't even realize her case was related to the hunt for the Grim Sleeper, until detectives approached her in 2006 at a laundromat with an array of mugshots. They told her about the new murders and explained they thought it was the same guy who shot her so many years ago. And in that moment, she realized she was the only known survivor of a serial killer still on the loose. The detectives asked her to take a look at the photos to see if she recognized anyone from the array. She was in shock, but she didn't see any familiar faces in those photos. Forensic technique techniques had advanced and the likelihood that they would catch the killer was greater than ever before. Now using Antares 1988 sketch, the police released a composite drawing showing the suspected killer both as a young man and age. They posted billboards around Los Angeles that promised rewards for information about the Grim Sleeper. Police now wanted the public's help to catch this guy. A complete about face from their earlier strategy. It seemed to be the only way to track the serial killer down. Finally, in 2010, using an emergency search warrant, police pushed down the door to a mint greenhouse nestled on West 81st Street where Lonnie Franklin Jr. lived. Known as a beloved neighborhood fixture, Franklin was a retired garbage collector who was always willing to help others out. He would fix cars or help move a bedroom bureau. Neighbors knew him as someone with whom to drink a beer. He kept a supply of car parts stashed in his backyard where neighbors could wrangle in old tire or rims for a quarter of the price they would pay at a garage. He lived with his wife of 32 years and dotted on his grandchildren who often came to visit him. But police were about to discover Franklin's darker side when they entered his house. They knew they had their killer after tracing his genetic code through a recent technique called familial DNA. Any family member who had a match to DNA of a person of interest, not just an exact match, would be explored further. Using this new, new, newly expanded search capability, police entered the DNA profile they had gathered from the past murders into the database, and Franklin's son Chris, who was sitting in prison convicted on drug charges, was a partial match. Using Chris' DNA, the police started to investigate all of his immediate family members, including Lonnie. It was a 100% match. The LAPD finally had their guy. During a three-day search through Franklin's house and workshop, detectives found hundreds of hidden photographs, almost 500 pictures, in addition to mementos from his crimes, pieces of jewelry, and pornographic videos with footages of Franklin spliced inside wedged in the back of his workshop in between two 4x4 four four pillars. The police found a Polaroid picture. It was of Interior, blacked out in the orange Ford Pinto on that fateful night so long before. 
Her eyes were closed, her shirt covered with blood, and the photo she looked dead. That was a summer day at the Los Angeles County Courthouse on August 10, 2016. Spectators shuffled back and forth, fanning themselves and uncomfortable in the stifling heat. They anticipated finally getting the satisfaction they had been waiting for almost 25 years. After a three-month trial, a Los Angeles jury found Lonnie Franklin Jr. guilty of 10 counts of murder and one count of attempted murder for a series of killings spanning three decades. On sentencing day, before the judge pronounced his verdict, the only survivor victim and other victims' families were given the opportunity to speak to Franklin directly. The spectators listened expectantly as Interior made her way to the lectern. She said her name to the crowd and announced she was Franklin's only living victim. She expressed her sorrow and remorse for the families whose children didn't survive. Then she continued, You are a truly piece of evil. You are right, right up there with Manson, and you did it on your own. I have fear of men who are supposed to care for me and protect me. She paused. You made me look at people differently, Interior said to Franklin, turning to him, but I'm still here. That will do it for today's story. If you enjoyed this story and would love to hear more, then please hit the like and subscribe button and even use the comment button to leave me to leave any suggestions. Thanks for joining me and see you on the next one. Keep it saucy.